Okay, great. So, great. So just to recap where we were, um, the theorem I stated um, was that this count, which is at, I hope, at the top of the page of um, branch covers of degree D from a fixed genus G curve to P1, um, satisfying an appropriate number of incidence conditions, so conditions that uh, one point maps to another point uh, is equal to this number in the theorem. Okay, and what I'd like to explain now is the proof that uh, of this. So there are two formulas, and these proof, these formulas are, of course, formulas for the same number, but the proofs are very different. Um, and I, I and I'd like to explain how the uh, how this Schubert cycle formula comes up. Okay, but I actually also want to explain where this two to the g comes from uh, in in the second formula. So I'll try to do both of these things at the same time. Okay, great. So this goes through something called the the um, the uh, theory of limit linear series. So this is a beautiful theory. Uh, that was written down by Eisenbud and Harris in the 80s. And in fact, this is in some sense a very old idea uh, going back to the 19th century. So the idea is, well, I, I, I fixed a genus G curve and I want to compute uh, some maps to P1 out of that curve. And well, uh, because and anytime you're computing something out of a fixed object, you can always degenerate that object and hope that, uh, and hope that there's, some, there's some limit objects on that degenerate thing that you can count. And hopefully this is some Kind of combinatorially tractable problem. Okay, so specifically, I want to take a curve, my curve of genus G, and I want to degenerate it to uh, this curve on the right, which is singular. And so it has a vertical component, which is isomorphic to P1. And it has, uh, and in order for it to have genus G, well, I attach G elliptic tails to it. Okay, so this is a nodal curve of arithmetic genus G. It has a rational component and has G elliptic components. And, uh, and remember that C also had n mark points on it. And I, uh, in this degeneration, I put the mark points on the rational component. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do I want to do here? Well, um, so what you can show using the theory of limit linear series is that, well, or uh, if you like also the harris mumford theory of admissible covers, is that, uh, so maps from C to P1 um, degenerate to some kind of objects uh, on the singular curve. So those objects can be regarded as what's called limit linear series, or they can be regarded as admissible covers. And so in that degeneration, what you find is that you're reduced to the problem of actually counting maps out of a P1, right? So now, um, somehow, in, in a way, I'm not really good to explain, the elliptic tails are, are kind of don't really contribute anything. And in the degeneration, somehow all of the interesting, um, all of the interesting geometry uh, boils down to studying not maps out of this genus G, genus G curve C, but rather maps out of this P1 that lives on the, the which is a component of the of the degenerate curve. So what happens? So the count I'm interested in uh, ends up being equal to to the number of maps now out of P1, also of degree D. And uh, I still have the condition that these, these uh, n mark points are supposed to map to the n mark points downstairs, which are, which are still fixed. But then I pick up the additional condition now that these, these, um, these g points, q1 through qg, which are the nodes of my, of my degenerate curve, um, are ramification points of this cover. OK? So this is kind of a, I'm taking a bit of a leap of faith here. Um, but what I'm claiming is that this geometric problem that I start with, when I degenerate it, I reduce to a problem about um, maps out of a curve of genus zero, right? So, and, and, and the hope is that, well, when you reduce the genus of your curve, you get something similar. Okay. And well, why is the simpler? Well, maps of degree D from a P1 to P1, I mean, this is, this is something very simple, at least in principle. Um, so what's a map of degree D from P1 to P1? Well, it's simply two polynomials of degree D. Two, so two homogeneous polynomials of degree taken up to simultaneous scaling. Okay, so this is mod, uh, mod scaling. Okay, and these polynomials are uh, kind of parameterized by their D plus one coefficients. And if I have two of them mod scaling, this is simply a projective space that's dimensioned 2D plus one. Okay, so I've... I've Essentially reduced to the question of to this this same question genus zero, but not quite because I have these additional G ramification points which have entered the picture. Right? Those are kind of the attachment points of these elliptic tails. Okay. 
So now what you say is, okay, now you have a projective space of 2D plus one, and I want to impose two kinds of conditions. So on the one hand, I, I want to impose the condition that, well, when I take these two polynomials and plug in the point P1, or sorry, PI, I get out the point XI. And if you're going to write down what that's saying, that's, that's, that's simply a linear, common, uh, linear condition on PD, 2D plus one that defines a hyperplane in 2D plus one, P2D plus one. And then uh, a slightly less obvious, but also not such a hard thing to check is that the condition that F be ramified, right? This is some condition about the derivative of F. Um, so the condition that F be ramified at QJ, well, that's, uh, that's a quadric condition on the coefficients of these, of these two polynomials. So what you find is that, well, my, my space of maps is a projective space and the conditions that uh, F sends the points of the source to the points of the target that I want are a bunch of hyperplanes. And then the, these new conditions coming from the de degeneration that F is ramified at a bunch of, at, at G points Q1 through QG are ramified. Well, that's G quadric hypersurfaces. And then the maps that I want, well, there's just the, there's just the points that lie in all of those conditions that satisfy all those conditions. So by Bezu's theorem, I get simply two to the G, right? Because I have, I have hyperpl n hyperplanes of degree one and then G quadrics of degree two. Okay. Whoops, sorry. All right, so I did that a little bit fast, but are there other questions about uh, what I've just said here? Okay, so of course this cannot be quite correct because if we already seen, as we already seen, two to the g is the wrong answer, right? So two to the g is this virtual answer, um, but what I'd really like to get at is this geometric answer. And we've seen that the geometric answer, at least uh, I've claimed to you from the theorem of the formula of Chela Pande Schmidt that, well, two to the g is the correct answer when d is large, but when d is small, there are all these correction terms coming from binomial coefficients, right? So something has to be going wrong here. And what's going wrong here is that, well, I've told you a little bit of a lie. Um, so this projective space is not quite parametrizing maps from P1 to P1, because if, um, for example, F, F0 and F1, there's nothing preventing them from being linearly dependent, right? So in this projective space, I could certainly have, for example, or F0 F or F1 could, could just be zero, right? Uh, in which case, uh, I have a perfectly good point of this projective space, um, but I'm, I'm not going to get a map of degree D in any, in, in any kind of uh, sensible way, right? Because if you just have a, if, you, if F0 and F1 are multiples of the same polynomial, you're not going to get a map, right? You're just going to get a constant map somehow. And in fact, when D is small, what you can check is that um, this, intersect this intersection that I've set up actually uh, produces points that you don't want on this locus, on this degenerate locus. And what's worse, those, those, uh, that you, you get some kind of excess intersection, right? And you can actually see why this is happening because, well, when F0 and F1 are um, linearly dependent and, uh, well, so, so what, what, what does that mean? It means that uh, F0 and F1, well, so, so, right. So how would you impose the condition that f of pi is equal to xi? Well, you would pl plug in some point and hope that you get uh, the point xi in the end. But if you plug in the point pi, and pi is a common root of f0 and f1, of which there are many, right? In other words, if this is a base point, then you're just going to get 0 comma 0, right? Which is, and when you get 0 comma 0 and you write down the equation um, defining the condition f of pi equals xi, this will just always be satisfied. Right, so when F0 and F1 are kind of divisible by say all of the, uh, F0 and F1 are bo both uh, vanish say on all of the points, then all these linear conditions are going to be satisfied automatically, right? Even though you have some kind of constant map without clear geometric meaning. And this ramification condition, well, that's some condition on the derivative. And well, for instance, if F0 is zero, well, then the derivative of F is just zero. Um, so F will always, F will look like it's kind of ramified everywhere. Um, so what will happen, and in fact, this only happens when D is small, is that these conditions will kind of be satisfied for dumb reasons, right? They will, uh, this, this sort of bad locus of constant maps will lie in the intersection of all of these, um, of all of these kind of hyperplane sections, um, but you don't want to count this, right? So this two to the G is, is not giving you any kind of geometric number. 
Okay. So how do you get around this? So how do you get around this? Um, you can you can try to use the excess intersection formula. You can say, well, I can control where my uh, where the extra points are, um, but this will lead you to kind of difficult territory because the excess loci are not smooth and they intersect each other and they're a very high dimension. But what you can do instead is you can do some kind of controlled blow up of this bad locus. So you can say, well, I have some, I have some locus of constant maps, some locus of uh, points in this P2D P2 plus one parameterizing um, pairs of polynomials that are actually just scalar multiples of each other. And I can blow that up, right? And the, and some, the, somehow, the point is somehow that you can blow it up in a modular way. So you can actually say what the points are in this blow up. So namely what I wanna do is I wanna take, um, Okay, so here's the construction. I, would I want to take the product of my P2D plus one um, with, which is the space I had before, with the Grossmannian of two plays in, a, in the, the D plus one dimensional vector space of, uh, so this, this D plus one is really the D plus one dimensional vector space of, um, uh, sorry, of, of polynomials of degree D homogeneous polynomials of degree D. And well, my kind of nice locus, my open locus on P2D plus one where nothing is going wrong is the locus where my two polynomials are linearly independent, right? Where they actually define some kind of non-constant map. And so when you have a non-constant map and when, when F0 and F1 are linearly independent, well, then they, then their span is a two-dimensional vector space, right? And that gives you a uh, that gives you a point in this Grossmannian. And when they're linearly dependent, well, then there are many there are many two-dimensional vector spaces that contain um, both polynomials. So what I want to do is I want to take the incidence correspondence where I impose the condition that uh, the point uh, of my Grossmannian, so my two-dimensional vector space, contains both of my polynomials of degree D. Okay, and again, on the locus where the two polynomials are linearly independent, um, V is uniquely determined. It's simply the span of F0 and F1. But when F0 and F1 are linearly dependent, well, then I have some choice of, of uh, for what I can take for V, right? So I get some, um, I get some kind of pr projective space worth of choices. Okay, and this is a space I call call 2D plus one. This is not quite standard notation, but um, this is a special case of what's called the space of uh, complete collineations. Can I ask you a quick question, Carl? Yes, please. Um, just the, can you clarify again, what's the, the square bracket F0, F1 notation? Right, so F0, F1, uh, so if I, so I've, I, I'm, I'm now counting maps from P1 to P1, mm -hmm. right? And um, so a map from P1 to P1 is given by two polynomials of degree D. I see. Because right. it's like a rational pot, it's like a rational function. Oh, 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 I see. The numerator, the, the so F not F1 are like actually... the numerator and denominator. Right, right. Sorry. Thanks so much. Yeah. And so that numerator and denominator, if I take the coefficients, that forms this projected space. Yeah. Um, but I have some locus where that numerator and denominator are actually the same polynomial up to scaling. So I want to blow up that locus. And that blow up I'm claiming is the space called 2D plus one because on the open locus where F0 and F1 are linearly independent, I have an isomorphism, right? Because my B is uniquely determined. And then on the locus where F0 and F1 are scalar multiples of, their, uh, of each other, then I have this choice of uh, somehow the, the normal bundle term is this choice of um, two dimensional vector space containing both polynomials. Okay, so the so the claim here is that the projection to P two two D plus one is the blow up of this constant map locus. And well, if I consider the other map to the Grossmannian, um, this is a projective bundle, right? Because if I fix uh, a two dimensional vector space, then the space of uh, so then what's the fiber over that? Well, it's just the space of choices of F naught and F one, both of which are in V, right? And that's sort of that's that's. Uh, that's nothing more than the uh, well. That's the projective bundle associated to v plus b, right? Because I'm taking two. I'm taking two polynomials uh, in v. And now the claim is that the uh, that this that this this blow up somehow resolves the intersection uh, on the previous slide. So what happens now is that 
So what you see now is that the ramification conditions and the incidence conditions, well, the ramification conditions somehow live more naturally on this Grassmannian. And uh, so the condition that you're, you're, now your linear system is ramified at some point that corresponds to some, uh, the Schubert cycle sigma one. Okay, so that condition, when you pull it back to the, the uh, is, is, is on, on the Grossmannian sigma one to the G, and then I pull that, pull that back to my collineation space. And then the end incidence conditions, those are again, linear conditions, but now I have a projective bundle as opposed to a projective space. So here now uh, I get the, the nth power of the relative hyperplane class. Okay, so in the end, when you multiply these things, um, well, you can think of these, you can think of this intersection as being on the collineation space, but then when I push forward, I can apply the projection formula and get an intersection number just on the Grossmannian. So I have sigma one to the G coming from the ramification conditions, and then I have the push forward of some power of the, the relative hyperplane class of my projective bundle. And uh, that's precisely the segregate class of the, um, well, it's it's uh, up to some shift in degree. It's the it's the segregate class of that bundle, um, which in this case is uh, v plus v. So what I get in the end is I get the n minus third segregate class of the bundle v plus v because it's a p three bundle, um, and that's this sum of sigma i sigma j. Okay. And okay, so somehow the content of this is that. Uh, this intersection really now does, uh, is, is somehow proper in that it, uh, all of the points in the intersection are actually points of geometric meaning, right? So this is some non-trivial uh, step that you have to do, but, the, the, but this is where this formula comes from. Okay, so the questions. All right, so let me just say a couple words about uh, some further directions. Um, so, uh, so again, this is I, I've spent most of this time talking about um, covers of P one, and uh, so there's a variant of this problem where you start imposing arbitrary ramification profiles for this map. So this is a this is something that I'm uh, I've been working out with Alessio Cella, and this should hopefully be posted soon. Um, and of course, the the next step is also to, to try to push this to projective space, to higher dimensional projective spaces. So what we can show at the moment is that, in fact, the geometric Tevelev degree equals the virtual Tevelev degree, again, when the degree is sufficiently large. Um, and I've put this number in red because uh, it's not clear to me if this bottom is sharp. Um, but uh, so I've, I've used this, the, the notation call 2d plus 1 in, somehow, some kind of project, in some kind of suggestive way. Um, and in some sense, you can reduce in the same way to some kind of question about uh, Intersection theory on some kind of space of moduli space of complete collineations of higher rank, whatever that means. Um, but there's some kind of new ideas that uh, remain to be worked out. Okay, so I did promise I would say a little bit about um, the uh, the question of enumerativity. So let me just just say I think I think I only have one slide on this. Okay, I have several slides, but maybe I only I only I won't even get to. This. Same thing with the last one, um, but the observation here in this uh, this result that I've mentioned is again that the the virtual Tevelev and geometric Tevelev degrees are equal to each other um, in some in some range where d is large, uh, but not when d is small. Okay, and then you can interpret this in terms of the moduli space of stable maps, but uh, I'll kind of not say much about this. So the expectation is that this is actually a general phenomenon. Right, so the expectation is that when you when you take any target variety, um, that this ver we've already seen that the virtual Tevelev and geometric Tevelev might not agree. Right, they already disagree for uh, in some range for for P one. Um, but the conjecture is that well, if you take some sufficiently positive variety, or if you're in some sufficiently positive situation, um, and it's not so clear what hypothesis we want, but for example, you might ask for X to be Fano. Um, and if the degree of the map you're considering is sufficiently large, so uh, in the most general situation, what you want to say is that the integral of beta against the, the anti-canonical is sufficiently large, um, then the virtual Tevelev numbers are enumerated, but not necessarily when the degree is small. Okay, so the most recent result, which uh, will hopefully hit the archive um, in a couple of days, is that uh, we have managed to check this with, uh, so Rahul and I have managed to check this for 
some examples, uh, which do come up in, in, in the paper with, with uh, Anders and Rachel. Um, so it is true for all flag varieties, um, and it is true for all hypersurfaces of in a very small degree. So, um, so degree kind of no more than the square root of the dimension of x. Um, of course, the expectation is that this is true for all fun varieties, which would be e less than less than r. Uh, but somehow the the methods do not uh, achieve this this bound. Okay, so again. Uh, we already know that these virtual tuple of numbers are not always enumerative. Sometimes they, they sometimes they give you uh, sometimes they give you numbers for which you kind of have no geometric interpretation. Um, but the uh, but the theorem is that at least in these cases and in conjecturally more cases um, that this is only something that happens at low degree. So if your curve class is sufficiently positive, then actually. Um, this virtual answer that you can compute through uh, through Germ of Witten theory is actually giving you the the correct geometric count. Okay, so I think I'm already over time, so I'll stop there. <laughs>